nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. Dr. Oscar uh, Kakbach, um, and he's at, he just left us in August of this year, and he is now at Grand Valley State University in um, near Grand Rapids, Michigan, I believe is where it is. Uh, so he's going to be joining us. Uh, okay, so my name is Osger, and I'm from uh, Grand Valley State University. I was with Penn State CNU very recently, and uh, we're going to, going to be talking about both the hands-on aspects and the computational examples. So I'm going to just show you like some fancy uh, drawings and uh, and some simulations, and try to give you like a, a flavor of how these kind of calculations are done in, in those uh, dedicated service that Terry was referring to. The first example will be in our blood flow. This is going to be the first example. Uh, we have lots of different uh, uh, particles, right? And uh, one of them is, of course, the red blood cells uh, that carry the oxygen. But the other is like these, uh, we call them thrombocytes, but you, go, you guys call them differently. I know platelets or something like that. I'm not able to pronounce it right. But uh, when I tell you the function, you'll all uh, remember. They make sure that the, the blood, will, when you have a wound, the blood will settle down, so it will stop the, the, the blood loss, okay? So that's the material I'm referring to. Okay, so we will have our channel, the microfluidic channel that's shown here, okay? And then we'll supply the blood sample, and we're going to, our task will be to, just to show you, like, these functionalities of these microfluidic channels, will be to calculate, uh, and to separate the red blood cells from the thrombocytes that I was talking about. For that, we're going to rely on electrophoresis. And remember what Terry was talking about. Now these particles, red blood cells and thrombocytes will flow in from this channel, this branch of the channel. And in our microfluidic channel, which is in the scale of microns, uh, they're going to be flowing. And under the influence of these Vs, V stand for voltage, of course, we're going to be placing our voltage supply in this fashion, right? So we have like these alternating power supplies, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, goes on like that. Our task will be to separate them to these two branches in the end, okay? So this could be like a lab on a chip that you can print on a uh, like piece of paper, like Terry was saying, like a specific, uh, a special piece of paper. And in a field, uh, you might be like very much outside of a city. You might be, uh, uh, you might not have access to uh, modern equipments. So you just supply it with this chip. And this is our uh, simulation here. Now, what you're seeing here is shouldn't be hopefully uh, frightening. What you're seeing here is the elect electric potential. Remember, I put power supplies. You can just think of them as little batteries, okay? So like those three, three volt batteries, one and a half volt batteries. So I put plus in the plus configuration. I always mix up when my wife tells me to uh, change the, the batteries of the, uh, the remote controller. So you can think of it like that. So this is like configured to be like that. This is the opposite. And in, in our microfluid channel, they're going to be our guide because these uh, particles coming in from this branch uh, have different uh, properties, electric properties, so we can guide them separately. Let's look at their sizes. The platelet, those are the thrombuses, uh, they have 1.8 micron in size. The red blood cells are larger. They're like 5 microns. And let's compute this. Okay. So this computation will take place. And you're seeing the result of it, but uh, hopefully it will put it on the screen again. So I, I hope you can smoothly see this. They're coming in together, the platelet, platelets and the red blood cells, and we're able to separate them nicely. So this is just one example, like Terry was saying, but this could be like one example among many, like all of those biomedical applications, like you're in a field that you don't have access to, and you like to separate things in the blood, like one particle thing from the other thing. So these are very handful. 
And uh, they also help us a lot to uh, understand and to diagnose the patient's sickness, for example. All right, so like we were saying, you're on the field, and let's say you're not able to apply five volts from here, you have some power supply, but your power supply starts to decay. Let's say it comes down to three volts or two volts, even more drastic. Let's see what will happen. Let's compute it again. Now we're gonna flow in the red blood cells with the thrombosis on, from the left-hand side again, but our voltage supply over the day, we, they're not at the full uh, strength. So do you see what's happening? We do not have enough electrical field to guide them nicely. So we are not successfully being able to separate it again. So these particles, they have to come under a certain degree of influence from the outside electric field potential. So let's set that back to five volts. But let's make the diameter of the red blood cells, uh, let's say two microns, okay? And then let's recompute this again. So they're now very close to each other in size. Let's see if we will be able to separate them again. They're coming in together, but because of the similar sizes, I, don't, I know it doesn't reflect the sizes equally, but now they're very close to each other. One of them is 1.8 microns, the other is like two microns, and they're going into the same channel. So we are unfortunately not successful again. So we should have our designs specifically built for the size, considering the sizes. We should do the math, uh, like for the this, for this species, species that we're trying to separate. We should apply the right voltage. We should also take into consideration the, the feature sizes, et cetera. So of course, there's a lot of math build into this, like Terry was also saying, but these kind of applications, these kind of simulations kind of relieve you from the restrictions of like being in command of all these uh, very, very detailed math, like uh, uh, Terry was again saying. All right, what else? Let's look at this now electroosmosis situation. Now, Terry said one more thing, very, very important. At these scales, See, this is a microfluidic channel. It's a 10 micrometer microfluidic channel. And my, uh, I'm going to flow in my uh, two uh, flutes from this channel here. And let's see what I placed here. I placed voltage supplies again here in these four locations, one, two, three, four. What am I trying to do? Or what is the task again? Let's remember what Terry said. Terry said that, at these micron scales, these flutes will not mix. You guys remember that vividly, I hope. They don't mix. So we have to arrange our Reynolds equation accordingly, but under certain restrictions, that may not be enough. You see the shape? We have two important helpers for us. One is the geometry. This will help us to mix things. But the other thing is, again, electroosmosis. Now, remember Terry's uh, snake example again, the rattlesnake, we talked about it. So now the flute will, under the influence of the external field, these voltage supplies, see, I just changed the polarity or simply I just changed negative uh, battery here, positive battery here. And this is just saying that they, they are not DC. They are alternating current, Nikola Tesla, not Thomas Edison. So under the influence of alternating current, I'm going to be flowing my flutes. These will not mix here. Just notice that they won't mix here. But when I apply the voltage, I will create that turbulence that Terry was referring to. Here we go. Now, under no field, they don't mix. They still go on to the other side. They don't like to mix. Look at here, they don't mix. But when I apply these uh, power supplies from these locations, I create these turbulences at the micro scale. And then in this micro scale world, they start to mix, like we shake, okay? So people build all these different kind of mixers like you can see, that these two flutes are again coming in here. This is fully done with the help of the geometry. We have these lamell mixers. What else? 
again, with the help of these crazy geometries that you have to build, this is a split and recombine mixer, as you can see. All these are possibilities. I will just quickly show you a couple of other simulations too. Okay, uh, so we this is just the simulation that I just ran here, but this is a star chip. This is a star chip. What do I see here? I have one, two, three, four, five inlets and one outlet here. I'm trying to mix it again. Like these, this is like a highway. I'm coming from all these different roads. It's just a crossroad. And I'm trying to this time make sure that I flow in from certain channels and I see the uh, response at the outlet here. So uh, over the time, this is how the simulations look like generally. So at time equals zero, I'm just changing the time. This is how it looks like. This is the dominant channel. So this is the dominant inlet. And when I go to say, again, like 0 0.6 seconds later, I switch to this channel. So I can be the traffic controlling guy. So this is the analogy. So with the help of my certain uh, electronics, so electronics and microfluidics, they hang uh, the, the whole, like microfluidics is also encompassing the electronics, the embedded electronics, but electronics help us a lot to control the, the traffic arrangements. So I can control, okay, this is how the traffic will go. Let's say what happens at one second. Okay, so now they are the dominant, these are the two dominant, and like say at 1.5, Okay, so I start to dominate my inflow from this channel, but you can see that all of it is channeling into the main channel after the, uh, the right amount of control, right amount of guidance. Let's look into another one. So here I have, uh, now so you're seeing the, the result of it, let's look at this. So I have these two channels. So I have these two inlets and I have uh, two different materials with different concentrations. But I would like to make sure that they diffuse to each other. What is the, the, the rule of diffusion? From high concentration to the low concentration. But if I just allow them to happen as they are, it will be a chaotic system because they'll just like to mix, uh, even though like, with the right conditions and with the right Reynolds equations, they will be not controlled well. Does that make sense? So I would like to make sure that they are nicely mixed, uh, not just mixed with the turbulence or the mixtures that we were talking about, but I would like to make sure that the concentration is nicely mixed. Like I'm trying to make a good tea with the right sugar amount in, in that sense. So to make sure that it's nicely, concentration is nicely distributed between uh, species A, the fluid A and fluid B. So I create this diffusion control channel and I start to pump in my A and B from these two channels so that they, and I apply the right amount of pressure. Uh, so I don't know if you can see the, the pressure amount. So they are higher in here and then they try to mix in the between. And now this is the output result. So you see the concentration levels here. The concentration here is the highest. We're looking at it from the species A. Uh, perspective. I'm flowing in species A here. I'm not flowing any species A here. So it's the blue. Uh, so there's none there. And when they go in between, they start to mix. And in the end, I have a very well, nicely distributed uh, splitting on those two channels. So this is up to me how to mix it. They will be extremely important. Let's say I'm trying to guide my drug uh, these two are the essentials of a drug that I'm going to create. I have to make sure that the concentration is nicely distributed. So I have to de the design my microfluid channels accordingly. And having talked about a drug system, so this is a really like used for a drug delivery system. So this channel, this capillary channel system is designed so that this drug, this water-soluble drug, with these concentrations that you can see, the higher spots, the, uh, the, the red spots are showing high concentrations and the blue spots are showing low concentrations. I'm trying to see over this capillary action, over this channel, how these structures will, uh, the, uh, the drug will be solved, getting solved inside the water. So again, just to show you 
like a brief taste of the whole uh, calculation. So over the time, so this is time scale against time equals zero. We plotted here. So we are here, we are just uh, putting in the, 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 the water soluble drug in there. And over the time, this is at time equals 0 0.5 seconds, it changes. And I can see the change a little bit better maybe here, like it say time equals zero. I'm not in there, the, the, the channel at time equals one, it flows in. So this is the higher concentration. So I can really monitor with these calculations where the drug concentration will be highest. How is it getting dissolved? So you see it's really getting more and more dissolved inside the water that I'm trying to simulate and try to achieve here. All right. After having talked about the com uh, computational side, now let's talk a little bit more about the, the hands-on side. So it kind of starts most of the things uh, about soft lithography, that's what we call it, starts with uh, after uh, Mr. or Dr. Whitesides from Harvard, because he's the founder of the silicon, this PDMS material that Terry was talking about. And uh, it's a wondrous material because of several things that uh, has been already laid out. But let's just look at it quickly. It's a biocompatible thing, the silicon, and uh, it will serve us great length to create these uh, really like rubbery, easy to mold, easy to create, easy to shape uh, microfluidic channels. They are chemically inert. Uh, they can like, uh, they're durable up to some extent, uh, if you take special precautions. Uh, and, uh, another thing is we can change the chemical properties as we will see briefly. So you can make it hydrophobic. You can make it hydrophilic with the plasma treatment, like we will see. And another good thing is by altering its chemistry, you can shape it. You can like sculpture it nicely. So on the left-hand side, you're seeing a, a PDMS, this polymer with a high, the, forget about the exact numbers, that, that's not the point, but uh, these two have different chemical properties to give different young modulus. Young modulus, this is low young modulus, this is higher uh, young modulus. Young modulus is kind of like the material itself can withstand the pressure. That's kind of like what we are trying to weigh in here when we talk about the young modulus. So you can see that we can really give good resolution and good shape to the material when we make this polymer by mixing with a little bit of bit, uh, different chemistry to give a higher young modulus. This is like 9.7 megapascal. And look at the shapes that we can attain. You're really like, Nano, uh, micron sculpturing, nano sculpturing, even uh, the meat, uh, PDMS at this point. Why is that so important? Why has this been so critical? Because once you shape this PDMS, you can put an ink droplet on it. And with the help of this ink droplet, you can just dip into the ink, okay, just like your chip. And then you can transfer this, uh, this ink onto a different surface. So let's say that you have your, uh, your master mold. This is how we will shape our PDMS like Terry was discussing. You put your polymer, your PDMS on the top, and then you cure it, and then you dip the, into the, this uh, ink solution, and this ink solution can be transferred onto the gold substrate, for example, all right? And gold can be etched uh, with the cyanide. And once you etch gold, this ink that you just transferred on it will be an etch stopper. So you can really shape gold easily with this help of the PDMS. This was a wonderful uh, achievement shown by um, Dr. Whiteside at that point. Now, to create these microfluidic channels, we're going to need negative lithography. So this is a device made at Penn State, just as an example. We're going to start to create our master mold because in order to shape this blue thing is our, going to be our PDMS material, our polymer. In order to shape the PDMS, we need a master mold to start with. And Creating the master mold will include a negative lithography process, which is going to be done with another polymer that's going to be called SU8, a negative polymer. Okay. Do you really need negative photolithography? 
Maybe not, but this is going to be the device that we're going to quickly create with you guys in the remaining five minutes. Uh, I'm just going to walk you through the, uh, the videos. Um, so these are going to be our microfluidic channels, all right? And the idea will be to mix the, the or just let the one of the uh, flutes to be guided in this channel, all right? So that's going to be the idea. But you may not need a, uh, a negative lithography to create a master mold for you. You can just uh, work with a, what's called a puffy paint that you can find, like this is the link that you can go to. So instead of creating a master mold for you, this can act like a master mold too, this puffy paint, and it's pretty cheap. So if you do not have access to negative lithography, if you cannot create uh, patterns with negative lithography, this puffy paint will help you. But at Penn State, this is how we do it. Master mold never. So just gonna guide you quickly. Let's take our wafer. This is our breadboard. This is gonna be our silicon wafer. Of course, once we grab our uh, silicon wafer, this is a large one, we like to clean it. Everything will start by cleaning it, right? And I'm sure Terry's class, the students will immediately recognize we're using what? Acetone, isopropanol, and water in that order. So those are critical. So the eye water, and then which will be followed by the nitrogen blow. So the user will then make sure that there's no liquid remaining on the top, and this will be uh, cleaned the, the, up to some extent, the, the wafer will be clean. Okay, I'm just gonna skip through that blowing process. So you, as you can see, the nitrogen is being blown. I'm hoping that this is nicely played on your side. All right, so, and then the dehydration bake is being followed up uh, after the blow because we like to drive that excess water away uh, if there's any remaining. And another nitrogen blow just to make sure it's like the particles has been removed. Now we're gonna introduce the polymer. This is gonna be the SU8, the negative lithography polymer. We're gonna be doing that on a spinner. So the user places it on the spinner chuck, and I'm sure uh, every one of you have seen in Terry's class the optical lithography. See, the user introduces negative resist, the SU8 at this point, while the, the wafer is sitting on the spinner chuck. What is being omitted in here? Can anyone tell me from Terry's course? The user is doing an optical lithography, but has just skipped one particular step that is generally being done in positive lithography. Uh, it looks like he didn't um, put like a layer, like a cover, like any paper towels or full around the um, chuck. So if when it starts spinning, the remaining, it won't just make a mess everywhere. That's good, yes, that's one thing. So the, you don't have those aluminum foils around the spinner chuck, uh, where we can clean it up to some extent with the solvent. So that's a good point. But the other point was uh, that I was uh, especially looking for was the, the adhesion. Do you guys remember? We always use an adhesion promoter before introducing the, uh, the, the polymer, the, uh, the photoresist. In that case, that was always H, uh, HMDS. Oh, I hope you guys remember HMDS, right? So that was the adhesion promoter. We skipped that. The reason is SU8 is, has a lot of good adhesion properties already. So it sticks to the silicon uh, underlying silicon wafer pretty well. Does that make sense? So we don't need an adhesion promoter. And SU8 has been used as a, um, already as a block material because of that in other micron scale technologies. Now, I see another problem here in the, in the spinner too. I hope you can recognize it. The spinner is a bit wobbling, so we don't like that too, right? So you like to make sure that the spinner has been nicely centered to get the best uniformity. Even though the user is doing his, his best, there's a, still a little bit of wobbling doing, happening on the spinner chuck. Right after this, 
this is the soft bake following. But see, we are doing the soft bake at two different temperatures, 65 and 95 degrees on two different hot plates, followed one after another. I'm just gonna quickly wrap up. So we are gonna put it under the exposure tool, our wafer covered with the photoresist. Now we're gonna be doing contact lithography. So this is the exposure tool. The user will now introduce the mask and will shine the light through this mask. As you can see here, the same mask that some of you have been already using and the light will come from the top and then we'll expose the, the resist, the polymer. All right, so this is how we put the wafer. Underlying that is our uh, uh, polymer the, uh, with the resist. See, the user is not looking at directly to the UV light during the exposure because it's not safe. So taking extra precaution, just uh, skipping through, but it, this is the result after the exposure. And the, the next step that's going to follow the exposure will be the development. So all the time you need the development at the end of the lithography steps. So we have a sol solver uh, called SU8 developer. It's not uh, exactly a solver. It's a developer, I should say. But the user will put the, uh, the wafer into these developers. Consequently, and let's look at the result before we start the, uh, the PDMS introduction. You see, we got the, uh, the, the, the patterns that we're looking for. This is the transferred pattern. Okay, now in the next step, we have our SU8 ready. We will introduce the PDMS, the silicone material. So that's gonna be done. I'm just gonna quickly introduce, so very quickly. So the, with the help of the elastomer, material with the curing agent. So there's a like epoxy, you don't mix them. Otherwise they're gonna be like becoming a hard material already. They're gonna start curing. So there's a ratio that you have to follow, but the idea will be to put on the, uh, the, the wafer that you just prepared with the patterns, you're gonna introduce your, your PDMS here on top of it. And you guys, whenever you have time, we already uploaded these materials. You can watch it, uh, the full extent of the videos in your spare time. But see, we're just mixing those two, just like preparing epoxy. I'm sure everyone worked with epoxy at some point, right? So you just like mix them well, and then uh, nicely let them cure on top of the wafer. Okay, so mixing them well, and then we're gonna introduce it on the wafer right now. This is what we're trying to do at the top. And we like to get rid of the water bubbles that might be the, the bubbles, not water bubbles, the bubbles. We're gonna suck them out with the help of a vacuum desiccator. So everything is happening under vacuum desiccator. And right at the end, we're gonna get our nice, uh, negative lithography result with the PDMS on the top. So the thing will be done uh, next will be to release the two. See, this is our PDMS covering the, the pattern underneath. By the way, we just, this is another pattern. Uh, the other was done at Penn State. These are our partners that have done it at Ivy Tech. Uh, with another pattern, uh, but the idea is the same. We're gonna try to create a microfluidic channel. So the important thing will be to release it. You see it, we are using a razor here to separate the silicon, the PDMS from the surface, the wafer. Just like that, just like separating uh, uh, this nice rubbery material easily from the surface. This is easier uh, when you create a surface releasing agent, when you put a surface releasing agent so that these two things will not adhe adhere to each other very efficiently. So you need to make sure that the separation will be easy and then you will trim it to create your, uh, your device. So this is just done by a scissor. So it's like you can see, you can just create, carve it out just showing you the result. So just by using a scissor, 
You see, we just got that portion that we just patterned with. And next thing will be to create the input channel. So with the help of the uh, injector. So just getting a regular injector. This is gonna be our inlet, the pump to punch the holes. So with the cutter, we're adjusting the, uh, the size of the needle. And then we're gonna punch uh, an inlet into the microfluidic channel that we just patterned. All right, just like this. It's quite rubbery, like you can see. Yep, and that's the input side. Yeah, and next, we need to make sure that this thing will be placed on a glass material because it's still, yes, the microfluidic channels are ready, but there's nothing underneath that will sustain it. So we will need to do a plasma treatment, uh, oxygen plasma treatment to both the glass and then the PDMS to make sure that they adhere to each other. So this is the plasma treatment that we're seeing. I'm sorry for the extra minutes that I just went beyond, but uh, just covering these uh, few essential points at the end. This is gonna make sure that these two, HMDS, uh, pardon me, PDMS, and uh, the glass will adhere to each other, and we're gonna make them both uh, hydrophilic. We're meaning that they're gonna have similar uh, chemical properties. At that point, the bonding will be facilitated and we can place the PDMS on right on top of our glass material and they will bond to each other. Before doing this plasma treatment, they wouldn't. But now with the plasma treatment, they like each other. They have similar chemical properties, so they bond to each other. It sticks and this is the end, the final testing. So we are pumping in from the input side, our flutes, and you see like from this input side, and then we are seeing the flute going to the other side. So this is really a nice and easy experiment that you guys can do. I'm talking for the instructors in your own institution, hopefully. And you don't need a negative lithography again. You can just get one of those paints that I was talking about. And that will already create the mold for you. You don't need the negative lithography step. But we also... Uh, uh, itemize the things that you will need, just like the recipe for a certain uh, desserts. Let's say you have these items and then you can purchase them. These are the rough numbers in terms of the money that they will cost. Once you put them together, hopefully you will end up with nice results with your students.